It is with great praise and thanksgiving we sing to our King, Jesus. Help us, as we look into the scriptures, to once again get a, a new picture, a better picture, a picture of Christ that uh, will live in our vision. In his name we pray. Without question, Connie and I have been um, have been blessed to serve here. Y'all have become part of our lives, y'all. <laughs> I sound, I sound like, like, like I'm from Georgia or something. <laughs> We're extremely grateful for your support and encouragement and friendship. Waitman is uh, on our list of special places. And we thank you all for thank you all for making us feel at home. Actually, well, I think from the first day. I doubt that any of us expected that, uh, that our stay here would be three years, especially since interim means provisional, temporary, intervening, short term. <laughs> I'm not going to try and recount all the things that have happened during our time. There are two reasons. First of all, I wouldn't make it through. <laughs> and secondly, I've been here three years. My memory wasn't great when I came. <laughs> so, uh, but I want to emphasize uh, what I believe is the crucial factor in Wakeman Congregational Church's move movement forward into greater ministry and deeper into greater maturity. And it's actually in your core values and doctrinal statement. The core values, the first core value is about scripture. It says the Bible is the final and definitive revelation of God to man. The first point of the doctrinal statement says the Bible. We believe that the Bible is God's word. It was written by men who were inspired by God and led by his spirit. Therefore, it is inerrant, authoritative, infallible, and applicable to our everyday lives. It has been, it's been our intention since we've been here to continue bringing you more, bringing more attention to the Bible as a source for direction in every part of life, in every part of the church's life. God's word does speak specifically in some way to all issues. The Bible reveals the first cause for all creation in the beginning, God. The Bible tells us why there's evil in the world. It's because of sin. The Bible tells us the solution to evil, salvation in Christ. That's just in the first three chapters. <laughs> Scripture explains the earth layers that some suppose are evidence of some kind of evolution. The Scripture explains that those layers of sediment were caused by a catastrophic worldwide flood. The answers are in the Bible. The Bible teaches scientific principles, the cycle of water, the earth suspended in space, the course of the sun. We find in the Bible family instructions, church order, future history. And it's been our joy to talk about these things whenever we had the chance. Not because of our ability or knowledge, but based on the authority of the God who wrote the Bible. And so I offer this for your encouragement and challenge. Don't stop reading and studying and preaching. Let me try and illustrate it with a story. There's a man named Michael. Well, well, that's not his real name, but I, apparently Michael's the most popular man's name, so we'll call him Michael. Michael had a very unique act, and he decided to take it to America's Got Talent. You know, so he got on the stage, and they, they said, well, what's your act? But before that, tell us a little bit about yourself. And he says, well, you know, if you've ever watched America's Got Talent, you know what I'm talking about. Well, you know, I had a rough life. I had a bad childhood, and my first girlfriend left me. And <laughs> then when I finally got to middle school, uh, <laughs> that's the way it goes. So, so, so well, Michael, what are you doing for us? And he, he said, we noticed you had a bag in your hand. He says, yeah, everything I'm going to do is in the bag. So it was a table there, and he put the bag on the table, and 
reaches in the bag, and he pulls out a, a little can opener. And he pulls out a frog, puts him on the piano bench. And then the piano is big enough for little fish bowls. There's little fish bowls on top of the piano. And he reaches in the fish bowl, pulls out a goldfish, and sat her on the top of the piano. And the frog started playing the piano, and the fish started singing more beautifully than you ever imagined. And they're standing ovation before he even finished, and everybody's applauding him, you know, and all the judges are going, oh, you know, they want to reach for the golden buzzer, and, you know, the whole thing is just the most fantastic thing they've ever seen. And just about when they're going to compliment him, he said, he said, uh, I, I, I can't do it anymore. I, 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 can't, I can't keep up the fraud. What do you mean, fraud? He says, I, I lied to you. We, we just saw this most fantastic thing. He says, well, and he starts walking off the stage. He says, where are you going? He says, I lied to you. He said, why did you lie to us? He said, the fish can't sing. The frog's a ventriloquist. <laughs> so, so the moral to the story is the, uh, in spite of all that, this, this young man didn't know what he had in the bag. So don't treat the Bible like a bag that you don't know what's in it. Know what you have there. And the best part about the Bible is that it reveals Jesus to us. We get to know the God that we just sang about personally. And the last few messages I've preached have been about seeing Jesus. You have a handout in your notes there in your bulletin. So far we've seen young Jesus in the temple exemplifying that we must act out on our Father's will. We saw Jesus in the desert experiencing temptation, showing us that he understands and helps our weakness. We saw Jesus as the one who can and will effectively give us rest. Jesus as the good shepherd who will never lose his sheep. The eternal Jesus who is qualified as creator to be in first place over everyone and everything. The last time we preached on this, we talked about the great high priest Jesus who was able and qualified to cleanse our conscience. And then after that, actually, we had another one. Jesus, the eternal lamb, who was qualified and able to bring salvation. That message was from Revelation 5. Today we're going to be in Revelation 19. In this last book of inspired scripture, the closing of the canon, the final word of God, is an appropriate place to see Jesus. Remember why? When we preached a couple weeks ago in Revelation 5, we talked about the title of the book. It's the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. A lot of people stay away from it. They don't know anything about it. It's about Jesus. And all through the 21 chapters of Revelation, we see Jesus revealed. In 19, chapter 19, we get a glimpse of Jesus the King. And so today we're going to look at, take a brief look at Jesus who is qualified as king to reign over all the universe with complete authority. Jesus is qualified to reign over all the universe with complete authority. Would you please read, follow as I read, Revelation 19, 11 to 21. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. 
by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Once again, John sees heaven open. He spies Jesus and he says, Behold! You may remember at least the thought that I preached a message on Behold maybe a year and a half ago. It's buried somewhere in the archives if you want to see it, if you want to listen to it. But, but behold, is, is, it's, a, it's a word that gets your attention, especially these days. When's the last time you heard anybody say, behold? <laughs> what do we say instead? you got to see this. You won't believe your eyes. That's behold. Jesus' public ministry was introduced by John the Baptist with behold in John 1, 29. I love this verse. John, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the gospel. And it's introduced with behold, not behave. <laughs> See first, then follow. What character our Savior possesses? John sees this. We're going to see it too. At the last song we listened together <laughs> with talks about seeing Jesus in his beauty. Well, did John, describe, John describes as he, as he sees Christ. He, said he, he's a, he sits on a white horse. The white horse is the steed of a victor. If you're going to win a battle and you had a, no offense to any horses of different colors, and you didn't have a white horse, somebody would give you one. Is that right? <laughs> white horses. It's called faithful. Jesus keeps his promises. Jesus keeps his promises. Jesus is trustworthy. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you will be able to endure it. Remember that when you go through temptation. God will give you more than you can bear. Sometimes you say, well, God won't give me more than I can do. Yes, he will. How are you going to grow? As a young, as a young person, you, you learn by getting more responsibility. You have to learn to bear more. And so as a believer, we, we learn to bear more. But God will give you strength and wisdom you need to stand that. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Just as Jesus responded to Satan's temptation, so he will be with us in ours. So what if I don't have enough faith in any given struggle? What if I don't think I can bear it? 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Because he can't deny himself. Did you hear that? Jesus cannot be unfaithful. He cannot be unreliable. You can always trust him. And we've seen that here in this church over the last three years. What a friend we have in Jesus. Remember that line? Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 Faithful is he who calls you and he will also bring it to pass. Jesus is faithful. Faithful and true. Jesus is true. That's another title, as it were. He is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is his name. Obviously, the tr truth is the opposite of false. Jesus is not fake. He's not a phony. He never misleads. He can't. He always speaks the truth because he is the truth. Are you tired of fake news? Are you tired of looking, hearing the news broadcast or finding it online and wondering, what in the world is going on here? What's true and what's not true? Have we faced that? Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So who can we trust? Where is truth? Who is truth? You can trust Jesus. He's true. Jesus is the foundation of truth, the fountain of truth, the force of truth. It's all wrapped up in him. And he manifests that attribute, in the, that, that truth in the next attribute. Verse 11 says he's righteous, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Jesus is righteous. 
And here that simply means that Jesus reacts rightly to sin. And Bill Mounts is a Greek scholar. He said this, any view of God which eliminates judgment and his, and his hatred of sin in the interest of an emasculated doctrine of sentimental affection finds no support in the strong and very realism of the book of Revelation. See, you know, he, I was reading this and you're going, why is he talking about blood on his robe? And why is he talking about this violence? And this, because it's part of Christ we need to understand. And hopefully when we're done, you'll love him more because of it. Jesus judges. It's the next thing, next on the list. And truth is the divine standard of judgment. Sometimes our judgment is based on, on a lack of knowledge. I know I've judged my kids that way plenty of times. <laughs> I don't think any of them are listening to this. I guess I Isn't it? Sometimes we don't, have, we don't have everything we need. Jesus always acts on the basis of full knowledge, and that's why he judges in righteousness. Sin is sin. Genesis 3, it all started. There was no way God could walk away from that without judgment. So Adam and Eve were cast from the dark, cast from the garden, and light was taken away from them. That's judgment of sin. And Jesus judges sin. Every transgression and disobedience receives a just penalty, the scripture says. And so in order to enact this righteousness, Jesus in Jesus wages war, which is the last two words of verse 11. It will be a one battle war, for sure. But Jesus leads as a warrior. The world likes a complacent, that's another quote, I just, I just found it to be so pertinent. The, the world likes a complacent, reasonable religion. And so it is always ready to revere some pale Galilean image of Jesus, some meager, anemic Messiah, and to give him a moderate, rational homage. We cannot control Jesus. In the future day that we're reading about here, all unrighteousness will be punished. The nations have disregarded him, have proudly devised their own plans for salvation. They have not been faithful or true. Jesus hates unrighteousness, and he hates those who practice unrighteousness. And the Jesus that is king over all comes in rage and terror. Whose side will we be on? We already know that this champion on the white horse is Jesus. There's further identifying traits in verses 12 and 13. His eyes are a flame of fire. This sounds like Revelation 1. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Here we see him with many crowns, you might read. This is a Diadems are different than crowns. Diadems are more glorious, more valuable, and symbolize sovereignty and rulership. And that's the word that's used here when it says he's crowned with many diadems. The winner of a race gets a crown. Believers receive crowns in heaven. Jesus wears diadems. The word is only found in the book of Revelation, and, and unfortunately in the, in the previous two examples, we find in chapters, we, we find Satan, who appears with seven heads and a crown and diadem on each head. Temporary. Then there's a ten-horned beast that comes from the sea with a diadem on each horn. I can't even imagine that. But in a limited way, each of these figures ruled, but no one but Jesus is more sovereign and rules singly. Jesus wears many diadems, many more than his adversaries. What's next in our passage? He has a special name. He has a special name which no one else understands. Well, I believe it's actually revealed in verse 13. He's the word of God. John uses that name for, for Christ often. John 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And verse 14 says that the, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son of God. The word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelled among us. So it's only fitting that the author of the word of God that we read 
is the word of God that we worship. He's seen with robes dipped in blood. Not a, not a picture we imagine. But the conquering sovereign has gained ultimate victory over sin and sinners. <clears throat> and blood flows from the guilty. John sees more of the same mission in 14 and 15. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, were following him on white horses. Let me stop right there. The armies from heaven are God's people, believers. Revelation 17, 14 tells us that. L listen, these, that is believers, will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And listen, and those who are with him from heaven are, are the called and chosen and faithful. <coughs> you think about that. The armies that come from heaven, if we're there when this happens, I, I pray we all are. We will come with Jesus and fight the battle that takes place on earth with those who didn't make it to heaven and are now living in utter sin on earth. Jude tells us, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they've done in ungodly, in, all, in ungodliness. Many thousands of his holy ones are coming. Angels may well be in this number, but this army is composed of saints who have been bought and washed in the blood of Christ and wear linen robes. And in this epic battle between sin and righteousness, there's only one weapon, and Jesus wields it. It's the word of God. Five times in the book of Revelation, John writes that Jesus' sword comes from his mouth. And Hebrews 4.12 describes it even more fully. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So here's the mission of King Jesus. He leads the armies from heaven to strike down the rebellious God-forsaking nations with the sword of the Lord, the word of God. Our world is not at rest, is it? It's been a long time since our world was at rest. Threats abound from every direction. COVID-19 has magnified the anxiety. We may be asking, what's China going to do? How far will the Islamic nations go? And the United States teeters in uncertainty. Here is the good news. Our Savior, King Jesus, will strike down the nations and rule over them. Every sliver of dominion and power that they might still possess will be removed. This isn't a conversion to godly principles, though. This isn't a, a higher moral standard. It is complete displacement of earthly rule and rulers. That's what we've been reading about. Usually, at Christmas, we read these words from Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And sometimes that's where we stop. We think little baby Jesus is going to be a king and, and rule, and we, we see that. But the rest of this passage says, There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. How is this endless government that Jesus has, how it will be enacted? What will be the, the motivation for it? The zeal of the Lord. The Lord is passionate about establishing a kingdom where true justice reigns. Are you passionate to be in that kind of a kingdom? I am. I can't wait. Revelation 19, 15 says, He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. I was thinking of the Battle of the Republic. It's going to trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Get right out of this chapter. But if you know Jesus through him by faith in his death and have forgiveness from your sins, you have a Savior and you need not fear any of this. As John continues to look into heaven, he understands how devastating God's judgment will be. Verse 17. I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, come assemble for the great supper of God. These last four verses show us the triumph of the king. 
and it begins here with this description of a, of a great bird feast. Come assemble. Great Supper of God. Verse, verse 18 tells us what's the menu. It's the, it's the uh, appetizer, the entree, and the dessert. And it's not pretty. The angel calls out, get ready, birds. A great banquet is being prepared. And John says, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that it will be, there will be no, no different classes of people excluded. No matter what station in life one may hold, no matter whether one is free or captive, with, or slave or free, or no matter what station they hold, without faith in Christ, all flesh will be the dinner at this feast. But not only humanity will be defeated. Verse 19 says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Kings of nations will fall. Satan's henchmen, the false prophet and beast, have a special destination, lake of fire. In Revelation, as I said, we don't often go there, but we find there are three main unholy characters, Satan, false prophet, and a beast. Description. In this in this place right here, we find that the the beast and the false prophet. Verse twenty says they'll be they'll be seized and thrown into alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. So two of the unholy trinity will be <coughs> cast into the lake of fire. No one is left standing. We have an unconquerable Savior. Verse 16 is his quintessential comprehensive title. I skipped over it because I want to end here. Verse 16. King of kings and Lord of lords. That's why I, that song is so perfect, right? Crown him king of kings. Jesus is the eternal sovereign. He's the everlasting Lord. He reigns over all. No ruler can oppose him. No power can upend him. No threat can phase him. No tragedy surprises him. No rebellion alarms him. No lie disturbs him. None of our failures deter him. No troubling events thwart his plan. That's our King Jesus. He's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put, God put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Eventually, Satan himself will join his foolish helpers in the lake of fire. That's in chapter 20. And it's everlasting. No more sin. No more consequences of sin. A world free from Satan and his unholy power. And with the return of the king and our entry in heaven, Revelation 21 tells us he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Father, how we await that day. And it, it, it does not matter when we enter the celestial city, how old or how young, if we have faith in Christ, we will be there and we will be part of this great, this great promise that I just read. No tears, no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. I pray, Lord, that you would help us, those of us who know you, to appreciate that more and help Lord for anyone who's here who has not fully understood this message to be challenged to consider Christ we pray in his great name